Good morning, good noon, good afternoon. Welcome to Virtual Morning Report. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the fam. It really is a family of people. Um, it, it's incredible how many over the last year and a half or so, how many names and faces um, a lot of us recognize here. And um, the CP Solvers team is thrilled for a very special VMR that honors two, um, um, two things today. One, all of you, and a special shout out to those of you who are um, joining us from outside the United States. Um, we love you all dearly. And um, the CP Solvers crew here, everyone who's here from the CP Solvers has a tentacle abroad, either they exist abroad or they have um, deep and passionate connections abroad. Um, and that's one reason why. And the other reason is we're uh, thrilled to be uh, joined by um, members of the VMR community and members of the Washington University incredible educational program um, and premier um, academic institution in the United States. And representing them are two people who are, again, a fundamental part of the VMR community, Mohit and Shreyas. Shreyas, do you want to unmute and say hi? Hello, everyone. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, wonderful to have everyone here. You know, we really excited to talk about our program. We have a, a quite an exciting case lined up. Hopefully it goes on well. Uh, I, I absolutely no doubt it does. Shreyas, you, you've done me one over because you know, as you just did with Vale, that my, uh, my tricks to getting to know people is to look at their background. Um, and so you've left me with a light bulb. And so the only question therefore that I have for you is I'm really curious what gets your light to turn on, not that actual physical light, but your, your internal light. What gets you bright, shiny, and going? I have, uh, I have this uh, thing where I have to wake up with the morning sun on my face. I keep the window open. <laughs> and um, otherwise, like if I don't have the morning sun on my face when I wake up, it's like, I don't know if it's a superstition or if it's my uh -huh. hypothalamus kind of messing up, but like morning sun on my face, it's a good day. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Hey, Mohit, is he secretly telling us that St. Louis is really sunny and that he can he can reliably do that every day? If he is, he's wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> the summers the summers are sunny. Um, it, it is quite sunny, but we get all four seasons, and that's actually the beauty of St. Louis. Wow. Amazing. Well, Mo, do you want to say hi, introduce yourself, and uh, yeah, tell us hi everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be back on VMR after a prolonged stretch of not being on. Um, my name's Mohit, if you haven't met me before. I'm one of the chief residents at WashU. Um, Shreyas and I uh, are excited to share more about our program, share more about St. Louis, and just, you know, the process of, of moving to St. Louis. I think Shreyas can comment a lot about that. And then I have now been in St. Louis going on eight years, so I am happy to share all questions about the community, all questions about WashU. I went here for undergrad, went now here for residency, so I know a lot of the inner workings. Oh, that sounds marvelous. It's so great to see you again, my friend. Um, maybe, uh, you know, we're, we're just, to ha just to have an outline of what we're expecting to do today is we're going to get to know these folks a little bit. Um, Shreyas is going to share a case that Mohit is blinded to, and you'll hear the magic of Mohit's great facilitation and really, I think, a window into um, how great their program is through their clinical reasoning and, um, and facilitation lens. But maybe we can get to know you both personally a little bit better. So Shreyas, do you mind just sharing, uh, sharing with us your background, um, what your journey was to uh, ending up in St. Louis, and just a little bit about what yourself, what's, um, what, what, what would you share with us in a few sentences? Oh, yeah. So um, I was born and raised in uh, the UAE and Dubai, and uh, uh, then went to medical school in India um, in, uh, in a wonderful city by the name of Pondicherry. Um, if... Um, I'm sure many of you have watched this movie called Life of Pi. Actually, uh, we have another person from Pondicherry in VMR today, Bro Toto. And we actually went to uh, the same city and uh, it's, a, it's a beachside city, um, small town, was a French colony in the past. So a lot of French culture, a lot of good wine. Uh, it was a nice place to go to med school for. Um, then I came uh, over to the US, uh, spent a year at Mayo Clinic. Uh, did some research um, exploring the role of uh, sleep apnea in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, was the first time I saw snow that was five inches tall 
ever in my life. So just like, how is this possible? How is there so much snow in the world? Uh, which I was not used to. And then I moved to St. Louis, which is very similar to India because um, the summers are humid and uh, can go up to 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So um, it was interesting. Uh, and that's been my uh, kind of journey to St. Louis until now. Uh, St. Louis, uh, I think it's a wonderful city. I think it gets a lot of slack because um, the Rams move out, moved out recently, but it's, I think, a very cosmopolitan city. Um, the food scene is great. I had my parents um, fly over from Dubai very recently and they don't eat meat. Um, and they were surprised by the, uh, by the options uh, in food that they had. I took them out nearly every day uh, to eat out and they, ne they never tried the same restaurant twice in the two weeks they were here and not once were they disappointed in the food that I had to offer them. So the uh, so food scene in St. Louis is amazing. And uh, if you're into like outdoorsy things, like which I love to do, um, I, I really enjoy hiking. And um, my aim when I moved to the US was to cover all 48 states within continental United States by road. Uh, I've done 18 uh, until now. Um, and um, I think my longest hike has been a 21 mile hike in the Rocky Mountains. It was a, it was a day long hike, which was, which was, uh, uh, <laughs> which was kind of sad I think because at the end of it, you're just like, it's just like, oh my God, I want to go home, but you've already taken the plunge and you want to prove to yourself that you can do it. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's, um, um, I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's my, uh, that's been my journey until now. And what a journey has been. You move a lot, you move many countries, many different cultural spaces, different foods, different restaurants, different hikes, um, and different states. Um, you're a man in motion, my friend, and it's, uh, it's a delight to hear, uh, to hear a little bit of your story. And um, I think very inspiring for many people who hope to make many similar treks and yours um, uh, landing at one of the um, uh, one of the most incredible institutions this uh, this land has to offer, and I think um, I don't want to I don't want to make Mohit blush, but I think you know you you should um, it's no it's no small deal to be a chief resident at one um, at said institution. So Mohit, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and and that journey to to uh, the space that you currently occupy. I think a lot of people that's their north star. Um, of course, that life's not defined by that, but I think that is a lot of people here are hardworking and ambitious. So tell us a little about yourself and, and how you can say Mohit, comma, wash you chief. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I begin, before the chat blows up with the case, um, putting my email in the chat, so please save it. Um, email is always open to have conversation both about St. Louis, both about Wash U, or just um, the residency application process and interviews. So always welcome. So yeah, so I um, have only, so I was born in the US. My parents are immigrants from India. They did their graduate school um, work in Kansas and then um, shifted over to West Virginia, which many of you may not know, it's a very small state, but you may know the song Country Roads. And Country Roads has, I, I even heard the song Country Roads when I was visiting in Thailand. So I think it is spread across the world. Um, and I grew up there, um, went to uh, undergrad at WashU. Um, luckily I was accepted. I, I fell in love with the campus. It was one of those epiphany moments where when I visited and went into the main patch, I just saw the beauty of the campus. And I said, I, I don't need to look anywhere else. I know I'm going to be here. Um, after undergrad, um, I did one year of research um, back home in West Virginia, um, working on metabolic syndrome and applying into medical school. Ended up staying in my hometown at Marshall University in West Virginia uh, for medical school. And then I always knew that WashU's School of Medicine and medical campus was this amazing place. I'd always heard about it. Um, and, and had always envisioned myself being there. So ultimately came back for residency and now staying on for a chief year, soon to be hospitalist afterwards. Um, but one thing I wanna bring up 
is my actual journey into medicine was actually very, very influenced by international medical grads. So where I went to medical school, um, Marshall University had their internal medicine residency program was nearly half IMGs. And so we had one resident who I worked with in the ICU, Mohammed Megri. He was from Libya. He was a practicing physician in Libya before coming to the US and starting residency. He now just completed a poem crit fellowship and is back to Marshall for faculty. And then the chair of medicine, um, Dr. El Hamdani was also from Libya. Um, he was a practicing OBGYN in Libya before coming to the US, started residency all over again because he um, chose a different career path, went into internal medicine, then did cardiology, then did interventional cardiology, soon after became chair of the Department of Medicine. And both of those figures were really, really influential for me to say that I want to do internal medicine. I had this whole journey in medical school of every specialty I go to, I love it, I want to do it, and I have no idea which one is actually my true calling. And um, Megri and Dr. El Hamdani were, were super important in seeing what a true physician looks like, seeing that humbleness and seeing that care and genuine passion for, for learning. Um, and to this day, I still learn from Makery. He's very active on Twitter if you don't follow him already. Um, uh, and, and to this day, I always look up and think, am I doing how they did? And, and am I role modeling the way that they role modeled for me? Um, all that being said and done, I think WashU is a very, very special place in my heart. Um, I've now lived here city um, and, and WashU as an institution is the, one of those places that whatever your interest is, we have it. Whatever interest you want to create, we will harness your energy and develop it. Um, and whatever path you so choose, someone has probably already done it here and will guide you. I've spoken like a true poet, my friend. I think um, you being anchored in um, you being inspired by folks whose paths have been long and convoluted and hard, um, I think is inspirational to all of us here. And I think the truth is a lot of people um, see you and are probably going to be anchored to you as you um, uh, guide us through, as you share with us your journey. So um, I hope that I hope that you're starting to see that you are becoming um, a hero for, for many, uh, as I can tell by um, sure is his beaming smile as, as I say all this right now. Um, and, I, and I think that you're, um, you're putting yourself out there with your email and by joining us so readily here today, it, it speaks volumes to that. So thank you for sharing your story and thank you for already passing on what your mentors did for you to all the people here and probably many, many more. Um, but you know, I, I've gotten to know Mohit um, through VMR and uh, through him joining us actually on RLR. Um, a few months ago, stumping us completely, a case that I'll never, ever, ever forget. So um, we definitely want to open the floor to you all asking Mohit and Shreya's questions at the end, but there's nothing like uh, smoothing the conversation conversation over with a case. And today is a little bit different than last week. So today you're going to actually witness Mohit take the lead on the discussion. He's blinded to the case that Shreya has brought him. So we'll see how kind Shreya is to Mohit today. <laughs> And with that, we'll jump into our usual um, CP Solvers uh, VMR format, learn, nerd out. Please, please, please feel free to participate as much as you want in the chat. Um, if you feel uncomfortable with your name being there, just change it on the screen. Nobody will know. And um, Shreyas, take it away. Please Thank be you, Robbie. Shreyas. Oh, absolutely. And we've come full circle, Mohit. So uh, just uh, as an information to everybody, Mohit was my first senior intern year in the MICU. And uh, now I'm presenting back to him, which is, which is kind of amazing. Uh, all right, so um, today uh, our problem representation, we have a 76 year old woman with a past medical history of myasthenia, well-controlled rheumatoid arthritis, status post left knee arthroplasty six years ago, who presents with 10 days of sore throat, multiple large joint pain and swelling. Oh boy. Okay, so Shreyas already picked a topic that I am very unfamiliar with, which is myasthenia gravis. Love it. 
Um, now we're entering into a world of rheumatology as well, also a weakness of mine. So Shreyas, next time we staff a patient together, you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a great problem representation because it, it highlights a couple of big things. The background information is always key um, to pave the way of your thinking. Without any background information, you are really into a world where the options are limitless and you, there's no real way to hone in your reasoning. So when I hear the story of myasthenia gravis and well-controlled rheumatoid arthritis, I think two things. This person has autoimmune phenomena. That means that they are predisposed or more likely to have even more autoimmune phenomena, whether it is related to their current illnesses or a completely new um, autoimmune disease. The other big thing to know, and, and Shreya's brought up a little bit about this, is how is that disease process for that patient? Rheumatoid arthritis, is it well controlled? Um, are they having a lot of flares? What kind of medications are they on? Uh, myasthenia gravis, like I said, is a big um, area that I don't know a lot about, so I would be actively looking up um, things about myasthenia gravis that I have now forgotten since medical school and what the current uh, treatment strategies are. And then a little bit about the actual HPI of being 10 days of sore throat, large joint uh, pain, and swelling. I think this is really critical because you have to first differentiate in your mind polyarthralgia from polyarthritis. So polyarthralgia can happen for a number of reasons. I can get the flu or some virus and develop polyarthralgia. I can work out and get polyarthralgia. But polyarthritis is actual synovitis with arthralgia, um, which puts it into a completely different bucket and in that area, you have to then think, is this an inflammatory process or is this a non-inflammatory process? Again, poly anything, especially with joints, has a huge differential. So you have to find a way to narrow it down. Just like when you think about fever and weight loss, which is nonspecific, in some ways, polyarthritis, polyarthralgia is nonspecific. And you have to find that X plus Y that narrows your focus. So what is that why? What is that other component that is helping me narrow my thoughts? And that's the sore throat. Is it a red herring that the sore throat is completely unrelated to everything going on? Or is it really an integral part of this process that's going on for this patient that in 10 days they've developed both sore throat and um, joint complaints? When you combine joint complaints and sore throat together, one big thing um, to think about is medications. So if they are on immunosuppression, there are certain drugs that can cause agranulocytosis. Agranulocytosis can present with sore throat and agranulocytosis can also predispose you to having numerous infections. So is this the presentation of a septic arthritis? Um, in a patient who is immunocompromised. The other thing to think about with sore throat um, and large joint uh, swelling, uh, arthritis, is it, could this be a disseminated infectious process like gonorrhea that um, presents like this? So getting a detailed history on this patient uh, would be very critical too. Um, I, I could probably labor on about this and, and probably repeat myself. So I'll, I'll pause and let Ravi share some wisdom as well. Oh, my friend, I have absolutely nothing to add. I really like how you um, approach the background first and then layer it on the foreground. I think knowing the context of the patient first allows you to be able to be able to put every little piece of the foreground within uh, the background. And I, I um, yeah, I think that was poetry. Um, so I'll pass the mic back to Shreyas to tell us more about the case. All right. Great job, Mohit. I think you hit all the big things that we were thinking about too. Uh, so when she came in, she actually uh, told us that she was, she was in you know, her usual state of health until 10 days ago. Um, when she started developing um, some myalgia um, and a sore throat. 
And she particularly says that her daughter also had a sore throat for two days, uh, but resolved. Um, but her sore throat kind of persisted. Um, and um, then noticed that the myalgia kind of started localizing to her left ankle and her left knee. Um, she rated the pain as somewhere between six to eight out of 10. She said that it was progressive. It started off somewhere around one to two, went to eight. Um, it started in her knees is what she tells us. She says it's non-radiating. She characterizes it as sharp, um, but she's not really able to define it any better. Um, she says Tylenol doesn't really help her with the pain. Um, she says that resting her knee uh, while lying down has does help a little bit. She's been trying warm compresses over it, and that has also helped her pain. Um, so once uh, the pain did not subside, um, she's gone to her local, her local urgent care center. Um, so in the local urgent care center, they have seen that she's had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and they've given her uh, 10 milligrams of prednisone uh, to take daily, and I've also given uh, an intra-articular injection of, uh, of, of, of steroids. Um, and that's when um, I think um, initially that injection helped her for about two hours, but the next day she woke up with a fever um, of 102 is what she tells us, um, worsening swelling and, uh, and redness over the joint. Um, this is when uh, she really got worried um, and, uh, and uh, decided to come over to Barnes. Uh, so once she came over uh, to us, we know we got a little more information from her. Uh, she says that she also has chills with those fevers. Um, she's been having night sweats too, is what she tells us, but, um, um, but says that she does not have um, you know, um, any um, uh, you know, any um, drenching of her pillows is, uh, is another thing she told us. Um, but she denies any recent diarrhea, loss of vision, eye pain, back pain, no, no burning maturation, no vaginal discharge, no dry mouth. Uh, and most importantly, she says that she hasn't noticed any new rashes over her skin. Uh, she also denies any dyspnea, chest pain, weakness, uh, but she does say that she's fatigued and uh, she's not been really uh, able to do anything um, over the last 10 days. Past medical history, her rheumatoid arthritis has been front and center uh, of, her, you know, of her health history, she says. Uh, so she was diagnosed uh, 20 years ago. Um, and um, uh, you know, she says that it's, she was initially started on DMARDs. She developed uh, an allergy to gold salts um, and uh, she was, uh, I think, I think, and once etanercept was uh, kind of discovered, she was started on that. And she says she's been relatively stable on etanercept. Um, her last flare was about uh, eight years ago. And once uh, she's been, and I think the rheumatologist she was seeing uh, decided that, you know, since her last flare was eight years ago and, uh, you know, that, and given she's, uh, she's, pretty old, they decided to stop her at Anacept about two years ago. Her myasthenia has also been stable. She has been on pyridostigmine 180 milligrams PO and PRED 5 milligrams every other day. And she says her last flare was 10 years ago and she's never had any symptoms from it, not even fatigue according to her. Um, she also has, has hypothyroidism, um, for which she's taking levothyroxine 137 milligram, micrograms PO. Uh, her other meds, um, significant meds, um, she's on um, vitamin D and calcium. Uh, she is on fluticasone, a nasal spray. I think we talked about the pyridostigmine and the PRED uh, and the levothyroxine. Uh, and she's also on KCL 10 milliequivalents daily. Uh, her, her, her family history is significant for diabetes in the father. Her mother died early. Uh, at 62, she says the cause was unknown, uh, but she says it was something related to the heart. Um, her social history, uh, she was she was an ex-smoker uh, with a 20-pack year smoking history. She quit 15 years ago when the rheumatoid arthritis uh, was diagnosed and they told her that it could be made worse by it. Uh, she drinks about one to two glasses of wine over the weekend. She denies recreational drug use. Uh, she says, uh, social history, uh, she says, otherwise, she says that she does go to an old age recreational center. Um, and, uh, 
Uh, her sexual history, she says that she's sexually active uh, with male partners. Uh, she attests to having seven partners in the last six months and does not use condoms. Uh, allergies, she's allergic to gold salts. Um, and uh, her vitals, uh, oh, sorry, I'll let it drop off it. And a sexual history. Um, vitals, uh, her temperature on arrival was 101.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Her heart rate was 124. Uh, her blood pressure was 118 over 58. She was sadding 98% on room air. Her exam, um, general, she was well nourished, but was in pain, said that um, her knee and her left ankle was the worst, um, but says that her elbow is also hurting and says that she's noticing a new swelling around her elbow. Uh, her, e, her ENT exam uh, oropharynx is normal, moist mucous membranes, no rash or change is seen. Uh, cardiovascular exam, uh, regular rate and rhythm, um, normal S1, S2, no murmurs heard. I couldn't really find any JV distension. Uh, lungs were clear to auscultation in all lung fields. She, was, she did not have any labored breathing. Her trachea was in the midline, uh, abdomen, was soft, non-tender, uh, ball sounds were heard, no obvious hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, skin, um, most importantly, um, so neuro, um, she was ANO times four, uh, cranial nerves three to 12 were normal. Um, she was not willing uh, for, a, uh, for a strength exam, her butter sensation was normal through all of her extremities. Um, her Skin uh, and extremities, I couldn't really find any uh, um, rash, uh, rashes over her skin, but she did have uh, erythema over her joint. Her musculoskeletal exam, her right elbow, uh, she has very obviously decreased her range of motion um, and swelling over her right elbow. She did, she did have tenderness to the point where she wouldn't even let me touch the area. Um, I did feel that... Um, the joint line was tender all over, but most significantly, I felt like the uh, area around the radial head was uh, was tender. Uh, right wrist, she did have some tenderness, but very little swelling uh, or deformity. Uh, her left knee, um, uh, we uh, examined it and uh, it showed a decreased range of motion, very marked swelling. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a photo of it because we had already done uh, um, an arthrocentesis by the time we, we saw the knee. Um, and uh, there was uh, there was marked uh, uh, tenderness around the left knee too. Uh, I think Rafa has a few pictures of uh, of the joints. Um, Rafa, do you want me to share it or did you? I have it pulled up if you. Whatever you prefer. Okay, I think I, I can pull it up right now. I'm having some trouble. Might be best if uh, I think you pull it up. Thank you. So this was a right ankle. Um, as you can see, it was swollen, and uh, did some have some uh, erythema. Um, I felt like it was. She also had uh, edema over uh, the distal part of the foot. Her right elbow. Uh, she hadn't noticed it until she uh, came down to bonds and uh, did show some swelling as you can see here i couldn't really see any obvious rashes but i think that's about it for her swelling um her labs um i think uh, her whites were um 
were 27,300 with uh, 80% neutrophilic predominance. Um, hemoglobin was 12.9, uh, platelets was 496, and her MCV was uh, 91.3. Her, her BMP uh, showed, a, showed a sodium of 139, potassium of 4.2, chloride of 101. Sorry. Uh, one no, 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 go ahead, please. For sure? Okay, okay. A uh, bicarb of 26, BUN of 12, creatinine 0.61, calcium 9.3, total protein 7, albumin 3.2, AST 2.24, ALT 25, ALK force 98, and total bully was less than 0.2. Uh, we also did a UA, which is normal, clear, no bacteria, no uh, mild proteinuria, 1 plus, leukesterase and nitrites were negative. Her ESR was 42, quite elevated. CRP was 55. The rheumatoid factor was 22. ANA was negative. Um, ENA was also negative, so a reflex trigger was not trigger initiated. Uric acid was 2.4, so normal. Uh, parvovirus was negative. 8CV was IgM, sorry, parvovirus IgM was negative. 8CV was negative. HBS antibody was positive. Um, and we did do imaging. Um, we can take a look at those images too. They read it as market subcutaneous edema over all joints um, and obvious, you know, right knee arthroplasty. Um, and uh, sorry, left knee arthroplasty. Uh, and uh, if we go down further, her, her toe showed uh, some, um, actually there was um, left fourth metatarsal subluxation as we can see there. Uh, but otherwise they just said there was diffuse subcutaneous edema. And uh, I will stop there and, uh, and uh, just for a discussion. Oh my gosh, I can breathe again. No so information. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I, the entire time, I'm just like, how much more? How much more do I have to synthesize? But this is excellent. So, uh, where do I begin? Um, so we were talking earlier about the distinction between inflammatory versus non-inflammatory causes of arthritis and arthralgia. I think we can very clearly say. I hope that this is an inflammatory cause. There's fevers, there's systemic symptoms, things like that. I won't go into too much detail about this, but just know in, in reality, you really need to pinpoint as best as you can the time frame of things. And that really pivots your thinking because in a patient like this, if the fever predated her um, corticosteroid joint injection, then you can very confidently say that whatever is going on, the fever is involved. But if the fever happened after the corticosteroid joint injection, then you may have to think, is that fever because of something that was introduced into the body from that injection itself? And that's a completely different algorithm in thinking uh, in a case like this. But I, I think for ease of my mind, I'm going to just say that this patient has fevers along with all the symptoms that they've been developing over the past 10 days. And, and now tying in more of the background information, you know, nothing really stands out except for one big thing, the medications. Etanercept. Etanercept is a TNF alpha inhibitor, uh, very commonly used for rheumatologic conditions but also very, um, you know, a very uh, notorious drug for causing a lot of adverse events. One namely is that TNF alpha inhibitors can actually create um, a drug induced lupus. Um, TNF alpha inhibitors also predispose you to reactivation of TB, reactivation of hepatitis, and also opportunistic infections in general. Um, so having that background is super critical um, and, and definitely frames the case. The family history, the social history, all that didn't really assist me until you got to the health-related behaviors. 
because we're in the city of St. Louis. This patient, Treyas, correct me if I'm wrong, is from the area. So for those of you who probably don't know, St. Louis has a very infamous distinction of being the leading city in the nation for STI. So St. Louis holds the number one spot for rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia. It holds number three or four almost consistently for syphilis rates. Um, and we have a huge population of patients living with HIV. So seeing this history of having multiple partners in the last six months does raise my hairs for if she's in the area and if they were not using condoms, is she now at high risk for having STI? So that is definitely something that is immediately in my differential uh, for this patient. And as many of us know, STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, disseminated HIV can have kind of nonspecific um, symptoms and, and signs as with this patient. Getting to the exam, um, I really hone in on the, the skin exam and the musculoskeletal exam. So the musculoskeletal exam and, and with the pictures depict what the patient is telling us. I don't think outside of the distribution of the, the arthritis, it really gains a whole lot of traction except for the fact that we don't have a rash to really go along with this. So then my thought of, is, is this a, a drug-induced systemic lupus uh, that is manifesting with arthralgia and arthritis? It, it goes lower on my thought process. So now that we have this, we have to then tie in everything else that Treyas and his team uh, worked up. The white count is high. Um, and, and that can happen for a number of reasons. If she's on and off prednisone, that could be a red herring or it could be a signal into something else. And this entire time, I'm thinking about the I made mnemonic, infection, metabolic, um, autoimmune drugs and endocrinopathy to try and frame what is going on. But to be honest, what is really, really um, critical is at this point getting um, as much information from the actual fluid in the uh, joint space. So getting an actual um, arthrocentesis, drawing, drawing fluid back and sending that off for studies is super critical. The ESR, CRP don't really guide me as much. Um, and, and everything else that has been worked up as well just narrows it more and more down to um, you know, something that I think Shreyas has not included in here, given the background of STIs in St. Louis is gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and the gonorrhea and chlamydia to know when you are working up patients, getting a proper sexual history is super critical. And we, we have the fortune of having um, Hillary Reno as uh, an ID physician here at WashU. She actually writes STI guidelines for the CDC. Um, and she gives us lectures. So she harps on this a lot that you really, really need to get good at, at getting a good history. Asking not just about partners, um, but also asking about the type of sex that is performed uh, or received along with, um, and you can't forget doing this in a non-judgmental way and doing this in a way that um, allows for a safe space for the patient. So it's very critical to know, um, are they having um, vaginal insertive sex? Are they having um, oral sex or anal sex, because then it also changes on where you are going to test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now, a patient with sore throat um, with a concern for gonorrhea and chlamydia, you may want to do an oropharyngeal swab. Um, if someone is having um, anal pain or discharge, then you may have to do a rectal swab. So these are very critical when you're, when you're thinking practically about managing these patients. Um, the, the imaging thus far has not really guided me at all. Um, I think I saw briefly in the chat, I've been really trying hard to avoid looking in the chat because I know they, they know the answer majority of the time before I can even think of it. Um, but someone brought up a good thought of a reactive arthritis. Chlamydia can cause reactive arthritis. Um, I presented a case on uh, VMR of reactive arthritis, um, but this doesn't really, fit with that for me because of the fever and because of the, the as well, the sore throat. So 
you know, I'm still actively trying to process everything that Shreyas has, has informed us about. But one thing I want to let everyone know in, in Morning Report today is that I'm not there yet, like Robbie or Reza, that I can off the cuff come up with everything that I'm thinking about, create the algorithm in my head and, and walk it through. That's a process that takes a long time uh, to, and a lot of repetition to, to make happen. So in reality, what I would be doing in person is going on Google, typing in um, polyarthritis and sore throat differential diagnosis. It tannercept, adverse, ev adverse events or side effects. Um, illness script for disseminated gonorrhea chlamydia, because these are things I don't actively think about all the time until it is presented to me either on VMR or in real life. And you need to be able to do that because if you just rely on what's in your head and you think that, oh, I can't look at everything, I can't look things up, you're doing not only yourself a disservice in learning, but you're also doing a disservice to your patient because in the end of the day, you have to do what's right for the patient and you have to do um, what, what will help you best to do uh, right for the patient. And what will help me best is talking to friends, looking on Google and going back to CP solvers and trying to see <laughs> what, what the actual differential diagnosis is like and the schema is like. So at this point, uh, outside of getting more studies from the actual fluid and maybe checking for gonorrhea and chlamydia, I would be searching up a lot more if there's any other workup that needs to be done. Um, Robbie, please take the mic. Oh, my friend, I, um, I have so many things that I want to reflect with you, none of which will surprise you. I mean, the first is, Trace has, has us on the edge of our seats. I think um, a, pre a case that is so well presented um, so concisely and so quickly, honestly, that features polyarthritis as the pivot point is rare on VMR. We don't really study joint cases very often. And I think, Mohan, you said you, you, you're so articulate both in your in, uh, in laying out bare what you know and then also uh, so authentic and transparent about um, where, um, where more knowledge is, where you're hungry for more knowledge. I also love how maybe without realizing and I want to draw attention to it uh, for everybody who's listening and is trying to understand what your program is like, how effortlessly you bring up um, uh, St. Louis and how it influences your thinking in this case. And also the fact that you get lectures from the world's expert in SCIs is a testament to the kind of people you're surrounded by. You know, I think if we focus on the medical staff, though, I don't think I have anything to add, but to just kind of explain why I think this is a very hard job. Which is most are most times arthritis is um, is a monoarticular when people come in with a swollen knee or a swollen ankle and it's one joint, and the the reason it's um, it's challenging here is this is not that the landscape when uh, when multiple joints are involved is very different than the single joint, and the reason that the single joint is so common and simple is it usually represents osteoarthritis or a, a crystalline arthritis. And polyarthritis may be an aggressive manifestations of those diseases. You have aggressive polyarticular OA or aggressive crystalline disease, but you start to worry about other things. And here, I think that Mohit, your conversation around the infectious causes um, and autoimmune causes and um, less commonly so the malignant causes is so apt. Um, so I don't think I have anything to add, but to tell you that this space may fool you because we have, may have more familiarity with the monoarticular version of this, which usually features benign conditions like gout, pseudogout, and osteoarthritis. And polyarticular arthritis is very different. It may feature malignant versions of those common diseases, but the truth is with a white count of 27, um, that's probably not at play. Um, so yeah, I literally said nothing but to say this is hard and it's hard because it's uncommon and you may borrow from a scheme of monoarticular arthritis, but that's probably to your detriment here. So start fresh in polyarthritis and listen to Mohit. It's either priority infection, then autoimmune, and then maybe even malignant with very delayed attention to the rare possibility it's gout, pseudogout, or OA, which you will mention in the first breath when only one joint is involved. All right, your hands nice to you. All right, so <clears throat> I was just going through the chat and um, I think I, I purposefully held back information, which you'll understand why soon enough. So um, 
being in St. Louis and Missouri, every patient with anything with a whiff of an infectious disease gets a histo and a blasto, and both of them came back negative. Um, HIV was negative. Uh, we uh, did an IGRA uh, on her because uh, she lived in a community, in a communal setting, and um, that was also negative. Um, we did a, a urethral uh, gonococcal chlamydial, uh, sorry, we did a, a blood culture too. Both blood cultures were negative at 48 hours, but before that, we've all, we had already done the gonococcal and the chlamydial nuclear antigen probe test, um, which came back positive from the urethral swab. Um, and uh, we had also done um, um, an arthrocentesis. We only got one ml of fluid from uh, the joint itself, but uh, that was enough. Um, we didn't do a cytology, but uh, the gram stain that was done showed intracellular diplococci. And uh, just to quickly go through the, uh, do you want to go through the course of the patient after we discuss the diagnosis? Okay. So uh, we diagnosed the patient, I think, as more correctly predicted with disseminated gonococcemia. Oh, hey, Todd. Don't speak to us. Uh, I think as he was talking, you know, there was so much information to reflect on that I even forgot that he didn't describe HIV. He didn't talk about the blood cultures. He didn't talk about the um, um, IGRA and histo. I forgot he didn't, he excluded all that. And I want to bring that up because it's so easy to anchor. It's so easy to have confirmation bias in cases. And I did that. I had those thoughts of, I mean, we need to check HIV. We need to think about histo in St. Louis. But I completely let that slide because my mind was so focused on, and serendipitously, it was true to be gonorrhea and chlamydia as a disseminated process. So even though I may have thought about it early, I still have my flaws in reasoning. I still have something I have to work on, which is, don't let my thought process confirm and deny it, everything else that, that could be going on. In the end of the day, you have to consider everything. And in a patient like this, I think that work, that extensive workup was really indicated um, and to not anchor early. But what a wonderful case. Um, unfortunately, disseminated gonorrhea is not uncommon in our hospital. Um, we see it quite often um, and and yeah, I, I think one of the big things is, like we talked about in the beginning, the background of the patient is super important, but not just the background of the patient, but the environment of the patient. So knowing about endemic processes that happen um, and also knowing about exposures that happen. Um, there's last week you had, uh, you know, our friends from Jacoby and they're in New York City. That's a whole different environment than living in St. Louis or rural Missouri. So you always, always, always have to put that into the, the um, front of your mind when thinking about the foreground of the patient. Oh, I, you know, I, I, it's humbling sitting here. I think um, if I were if I were thinking about applying this year, I would be like, whoa, that is one heck of a cohesive story um, by a resident put together, clearly demonstrating a lot of advanced knowledge about um, polyarthritis and how that diagnosis is made, and um, a lot of humanity in that in that story in that um, storytelling too. Shreyas, thank you so much for bringing such a marvelous case to us. We really really appreciate it. And Moy, I mean, I don't know what you mean by like, oh, I'm not at resident Robbie's level. That was an outstanding discussion. I really hope you get to listen to it again. It's it's your own um, sense of self is often much less than what you're actually delivering, and sometimes you can see that gap when you. Uh, or listening to yourself, but sometimes it's actually a little bit nauseating to hear your voice come back at you. Um, but I, 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 this is absolutely marvelous. And I think I learned a lot from this case. And I, I'm sure that everybody did who was tuning into it um, also appreciated it. And yeah, you know, gonorrhea is, gonorrhea is a very tricky infection. And I think for me, if I were to share one thing that you would take away from this case is to be, is um, that um, as you focus in on infection versus autoimmune versus malignant causes of arthritis, your focus initially is gonna be on infectious causes and there's a big, big problem. And the problem is at best, the yield of the synovial cultures in general speaking are about 70%. 
So even if you have a bacteria in your, in your uh, synovium, you won't culture it 30% of the time. Uh, for gonorrhea, that's actually even lower. Um, it's 50%. And so you can imagine it's a little bit higher than 70%, which is the average when you have staph or strep. And so you have to be ready to, to look elsewhere. And you look elsewhere in three different places. You look elsewhere by getting blood cultures, which are positive in 50% of patients. You look elsewhere by um, getting gonorrhea and chlamydia swabs from the throat, uh, urethra, rectum, vagina, wherever there was uh, exposure. And you look elsewhere in the rarest of situations by looking for adjacent osteomyelitis, because sometimes there's spillover septic arthritis from the bone being infected right next to it. Here, I think we got really lucky, and I think we got lucky because both were positive, which is rare, but know that on this hunt for septic arthritis, you're, you're going to get unlucky 30% 30, 30 of the time, in which case you can um, plug that hole with the same number, three, 30%, um, 30 three holes, um, got, uh, swabs of, from mucosal surfaces, blood cultures, and the adjacent bone that goes a long, long way. But um, enough of that, enough of that. I would love to, now that you have shared with us a slice of St. Louis and the slice of your all and how you think about medicine, would love to open up to the crowd to see what questions they have about you, your program, what life with St. Louis would be like and anything. Um, and I'll, yeah. Can I say something, Robbie? I, oh. I, uh, this is Brody yeah, and, uh, and this is about, uh, as you introduced myself, uh, yeah, I, uh, I also grew, like, at, like Shreyas, I also attended the med school in Pondicherry, in idyllic Pondicherry. We were, he was one batch ahead of me and he was yeah. really, and he's one of the persons who's really helped me a lot through my, throughout my US assembly journey, starting from step one to all the other steps. Then finally we were, uh, he was there in Mayo too. I went there after him. And then, uh, then he matched into Washio and, uh, and I, I was still there at Mayo at that time. And then I, so, and again, and now I'm at Stanford doing postdocship, but, but I, again, this application season this year, like I think Shreyas has helped, has been one of the key persons who have really helped me throughout my journey. And I really want to take the chance to appreciate how, you know, how supportive he is um, oh. as a person. So, yeah. Thank you, Shreyas. That's very sweet. Oh, I think you're making him blush. You just get a thumbs up though. That's really, really sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. That's very, very kind of you to say that out loud. So um, to reflect on the program, we'll let folks in the chat ask as many questions as their heart desires from zero to as many as they want. Um, I'm, cur I'm curious to ask you, as like, Shreyas, if you had to, and to you, Mohit, like if you had to nail down really, what is, the, is, what is it that is um, the singular best part about your experience at, in the WashU internal medicine program, what would that be? So it's been kind of distinct for me in the way that I was uh, moving into a new city it was a relatively newer country in the midst of a pandemic, which added a layer of uh, convolution and uh, and uh, complexity to the whole process. Um, and uh, I think I couldn't have asked for a better experience because I think I didn't realize it until I had it because I think being have, being accepted in the program for who you are is going to be critical for your growth. I feel like, uh, you know, you have to be in a place that allows you to kind of flourish and really thrive um, being yourself. And that's the only way I feel like, uh, you know, you can really grow. And I think Wash U has been amazing for that. I never felt like I was alone. You know, I never felt it was a new city. I had no friends within the city. I've always felt at home. You know, I never felt, I never had, I was always well supported. Initially, you know, we were in, even in the midst of, a, of, of the, uh, of the worst parts of the pandemic. I was in the ICU then, and it's amazing how well supported we feel, how the program made sure that our learning never got uh, com uh, you know, compromised. I think that's very critical because um, I think being acknowledged uh, that, you know, having, like, having the acknowledgement that, you know, you, you do have to train, you do have to learn, you only have three years to, uh, you know, uh, to learn as much as possible. It, of course, there's, there's more time, but at least the, the protected time that you get as a resident has to be, you know, optimized for learning. I think that's very important. Um, and I think that WashU um, is, um, is a testament to that. I think they made sure that every resident got the most out of their time uh, from the pandemic and from without the pandemic. So uh, I think um, that's one big thing about the, uh, about the program itself, but I'd let uh, Mohit kind of uh, continue. Yeah. 
I, I love that. I'm so glad that you feel that way. Um, I think now being in a leadership role, seeing the amount of effort it takes to make sure that the experience is still very supportive and very protected during an ongoing pandemic has been has been hard. So I'm glad that that sentiment holds true for you and hopefully others. Um, the big thing for me that I got exposed to early and really um, value now reflecting on my time is there is so much autonomy in this program with support. So you are not autonomous because you are forced into an environment where either you're the sole person managing things so you just have no choice. You are autonomous because we breed that ability to think on your own, to manage on your own the entire time knowing that we are looking behind the curtains. We are still there making sure that things are okay and being double checked but we're not making you explicitly known about it. And I, and I think that really, really trickles down to everything because what is residency but preparing you to be an independent clinician? What is residency beyond developing the frameworks to then go into fellowship or whatever else you so choose? And in order to do that, you not only need a nurturing environment like Shreyas is talking about, but you need to have that ability to spread your wings as you would like to. Um, so, you know, I can, I can labor on about that, but let me give you specifics. So whenever you're on any rotation, you always have a senior resident who's with you, or you have a fellow who's with you, and there's almost always an attending in-house. So if I, so an example would be if I'm on night float for cardiology wards, I'm combined with the senior resident who is helping manage everything as I need it. They help with admissions, they help discuss cases, they help um, come up with plans, um, but all of the cross coverage is on the intern. So if there's 50 patients on the cardiology service, the intern is managing those calls from nurses. Hey, this patient has developed a fever. Hey, this patient is having chest pain. But the entire time, the senior resident is in the same room just listening and just hearing about a little bit of a crackle in the voice from the intern. I, 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 I'm not sure, and at that point is when the senior says, hey, is everything okay? Are you comfortable managing that call? Not projecting in saying, I think you should do this. No, you're wrong, let me do this instead. So I think that is the real culture that I've really, really valued and appreciated here, that you're always protected, you're always supported, um, but you were given that ability to, to make decisions on your own uh, and get the feedback from that. Um, I think there are some questions coming in from the chat, but one thing that I also wanted to say um, that I mentioned before is that if it is something that you're interested in, we have it here. Um, if it's research and if it's very, very nuanced, very particular research, we have it. Um, if it is I want to develop as a clinician educator, we have a track for that. We have plenty of clinician educators that will model that behavior and will guide you through it. Um, and, and very much with open arms, pull you into developing curriculum, pull you into teaching um, your own uh, residency program or the medical students. Um, if it's leadership that you want, a lot of the internal medicine faculty are on leadership committees or very high up in leadership within the hospital and within the school of medicine, and you can get tagged in with them. So it, it truly is the case that whatever it is that you want, whatever passion you have, it is um, very much supported here, very much wanting to enable that passion on top of you becoming an excellent clinician. Absolutely brilliant answers. You know, there's so many questions coming in the the chat that I'll just move through them. So, um, Dania, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. So, um, my question was, um, since I am an IMG and a not and not living in the U.S., um, I want to know what is the general acceptance rate in Washington University for people who have graduated from outside of uh, the U.S. and then uh, are applying for residency? Yeah. 
then thanks for asking that question. I honestly don't have an answer for you because I don't, I'm not as um, involved in those numbers and metrics uh, that you might be asking for. But what I will say is that um, I think WashU has gone through a big shift in culture over the past three to five years. We, uh, our program director, Dominique Costco, she's fantastic. She's a very excellent educator throughout the nation. She's known. Um, and she joined in as program director while I was in residency. And she's been making, oh my gosh, so many great changes for the program. I can, I can only, you know, I wish I had an entire VMR to talk about all the, the pros of our program director. But one thing that she's really emphasized is a holistic process to the application process. So it may have been back before, before I was a resident, that there were maybe some screening mechanisms that were outdated, and now we are no longer doing things like that. We're looking at applications as a whole, um, and, and we're, as much as we can, be blinded to um, who you are as a person, but more so your qualifications. Um, the uh, to give you some solace, because I can't give you an exact percentage or, or number that you may want, but just know that, you know, Shreyas is not alone in this program as an international grad. Um, and also we've had international grads be chiefs. Two years ago, one of our chief residents was uh, uh, an international grad from Ireland. Um, and one of my best friends from uh, my class uh, who moved on for fellowship and now was also um, an international grad from Ireland. And so it's, um, the, the community is there, not even just within our internal medicine uh, department, but the, the fellowships and also um, other departments and other divisions. Uh, and I think that's one great thing about WashU is that um, ev you name the, the specialty and we have it and they excel in it. And, and each one of those specialties really, really brings in um, uh, this desire to have people from various backgrounds. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you for being as transparent and honest as you can be. Felipe, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah. So hi, and, and, and thank you for the wonderful discussion that, that, that took place and, and for being with us this morning. I, I know you guys aren't in charge of this yet, um, but what, what do you speculate once because you know, step one is 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 becoming pass fail, and for a couple of years, people are going to be applying with. There, there's going to be mixed scores. People that took step one before it became pass fail. How do you think they'll? Will they blind themselves to the to to the score? Will how will they weigh that? Um, what what are your thoughts? I I know now we don't even have like a strict score delineation okay you are now considered you are not considered so i don't think a whole lot is going to change to be honest because we like i was saying look at a holistic process so we look at who you are as a person what your background um, experiences have been um, and who you want to become and and that is really what we look at in, in applications not as much the the minutia of scores because you have to, like in a case, take the background of a patient to think about the foreground. In the same way, in, in looking at applications, you have to take the, the applicant as a whole in, in what they want to achieve and what they've achieved up to this point um, before you even talk about scores. So I, I honestly don't think that the, the pass-fail change is going to make a lot of difference in, in our um, process. Um, but like you said, I don't have the exact details on how they maneuver around that. But from talking to Dr. Costco, knowing who she is and, and knowing what she strives for in the program, I can say for sure that um, your, your board scores does not define. Love it. I'll combine a couple of questions. I, um, Hamza and Franco were getting at a theme of teaching and didactics. So they were curious what didactic sessions you offer and uh, specifically within clinical reasoning, what that landscape looks like at your program. Yeah. Um, Shreyas, do you want to talk through our um, conference structure? We yeah. can, what opportunities there are, and then I can talk about the teaching pathway. 
Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think um, so we do have noon conferences, um, two days of the uh, we have noon conferences every day, but we have didactics on Tuesday and Thursday where we uh, base it on ECGME kind of uh, recommendations. But uh, on other day or uh, on we also have intern and resident report, which is very which is structured very similarly uh, to what uh, to what uh, the CP solvers do, uh, where we kind of uh, have an open discussion about uh, a particular case, and uh, we usually have it happen two times every week. So um, that way, we know we, we are we. Are, it serves two purposes. I think one, we we kind of are uh, in sync with what the other teams are seeing too, because it's such a large residency program uh, with um, with eight med firm teams, four cardiology teams, just in 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 patient services. I think. Um, anything that's interesting uh, is brought to the forefront during that particular conference uh, every week. Um, but additionally, I think noon conferences as a whole um, is amazing because uh, you have world leaders kind of uh, talk to you about uh, um, um, you know uh, topics, and they re they make it really relevant. It's not usually obscure and esoteric uh, to the point where residents. Uh, uh, with the resident level of training, you wouldn't be able to understand it. I think they made sure that, you know, people, residents, it re remains relevant to resident level training. And that's quite important. Um, outpatient uh, wise, I think we have, I think, an amazing uh, training program um, with uh, Dr. Deptola organizing it. Um, she, you know, I think, it's, I think it's one of the highlights of the program, really, because we get to. Um, it's very streamlined. There's. Uh, I think they. I think they're very. Uh, I think the uh, leadership is um, using learning theory as a as a background to make sure that us as residents can get the most out of uh, uh, these sessions and not just you know zone out and not really get uh, anywhere with these pro with these sessions. So, um, you know, I feel like you get a lot of bang for your buck for the time you spend there because it's it's only one half day during clinic blocks um which makes it quite uh, you know uh, quite an high, quite a high yield kind of a session and we we learn about ambulatory care but we also learn about you know uh, larger uh, career based uh, uh, things like you know where how do you decide where you want to go you know you can only do so much you only have so many so much time how do you want to decide where you want to be in 10 years time what the current landscape is like for academia uh, within academia are you going into leadership administrative jobs uh, or are you going into research-based uh, positions i think these are these are topics that are discussed in quite some nuance uh, during these sessions and uh, it's a small group too which makes uh, conversation and and uh, and uh, nuanced discussion kind of possible um, I think that's uh, I think these are the biggest things we do for education but there's a lot of peer-based education like most residencies you don't you learn more from your peers uh, than from lectures I think that's that's a very important part of my own learning I feel like I've learned so much from my time uh, in the in the in the on the floors and in the clinics because uh, you know I think the peers we have here are amazing. They're very, they're very um, humble. They're always willing to teach you. I think coming in, you know, not knowing anything is is um, is actually encouraged. It's actually, I think, the culture of you know not knowing uh, anything is actually encouraged rather than acting like you know what you're doing because as an intern you actually don't. And uh, I think they use that as leverage to actually teach you more. Uh, um, and I think that's I think that's another very big part about the culture of the program. Uh, you know the um, the uh, you know the overall culture of teaching and uh, and uh, growth rather than knowing. Yeah, and I'll I'll just tag team with that. Um, so just to make everyone know, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday at noon, there's noon conference. Monday, Wednesday is primarily focused on internal medicine core topics. Thursday is also medicine topics, but can also be about the healthcare system. It can also be like Shreyas was talking about kind of the global process of becoming a clinician. Um, so um, Tuesdays every week, 
we have Journal Club as well. I think that's also a very unique thing about WashU is that we really have a huge focus on evidence-based medicine and we want you to appraise the literature and learn the, the techniques required to really criticize um, evidence. And so every week there's an intern and journal, um, intern and resident journal club that are separate from each other. The interns focus on seminal articles in various disciplines within medicine. You get tagged with um, a biostatistician and a mentor within that field to then create your presentation and present it with your, with your co-interns. Um, residents, they kind of get a choice to on um, what topics are interesting to them uh, to present. Um, and the chief residents run those, those uh, journal clubs as well. Um, on Fridays, uh, we start the year with our uh, education conference called the Internal Medicine uh, Emergency Lecture Series. So we get faculty members from every single specialty within internal medicine and then some outside of internal medicine to give us really a, a really quick primer on when you're on the floor or in the hospital or in the clinic, these are your red flags to think about. These are what you do and who you call. Um, so that everyone is brought into a very um, good understanding early on on how to, how to think about very sick patients. Um, we then follow that up with a financial education lecture series um, because we all know that it is a very long process to become a, a physician, especially for IMGs. Um, and so we have a month long series where every week we bring in um, people from the, de the Department of Financial Aid and other people within the St. Louis community to share um, tips and tricks on personal finance. Um, and then after all that's done through the summer, we kick off our clinical pathologic conference that happens, happens weekly. That's also on Fridays. Um, the uh, beauty of CPC is it really is like you see in BMR that you get a chief resident combined with an attending physician discussing a case together. Um, and you see that live, you see that thinking, um, all up front. And it was actually the reason why I really, after I interviewed here, said that I, level of clinical reasoning that was displayed was just incredible, not something I saw elsewhere. Um, it's definitely our most highly rated uh, conference. And they're all real cases from Barnes because the residents send in these cases to the chiefs to then go through and, and create the, the presentation for, uh, for our attendings. And then Thursday mornings, we have weekly grand rounds as well. This is department wide. Um, and we bring in people not just within our institution, but all over uh, the country. Um, one of Robbie's dear friends and mentors, Gupreet Dhaliwal, is actually going to be uh, coming this month, at least via Zoom. Um, and uh, it, it's an amazing series of conferences as a whole, but also grand rounds specifically because it brings in um, not just people who are just clinicians, it's clinician and something else. They talk about the upcoming research. They talk about the upcoming policy changes. Um, they, we had last week um, the chief wellness officer from Stanford uh, giving us a talk about burnout and resilience and, and physician well-being, especially during a pandemic. So it really goes through every single topic you can think about. I know there are more and more questions in the chat, but I briefly want to talk about the teaching pathway because a couple of people asked about it. Um, the teaching pathway is run by Dr. Uh, Patricia Cow, who uh, is a nephrologist and APD. Uh, she uh, created this pathway. It is open not just to internal medicine, but all other specialties and training programs and fellows. Um, so even one of our cardiology, interventional cardiology fellows was a teaching uh, pathway person and med ed fellow. Um, we have people from OBGYN, people from um, pediatrics, you name it, and general surgery, all in this program, and all learning together on how to develop as a clinician educator. It's a two-year program, um, starts in your second year, you apply in your intern year, um, you go through didactics of uh, learning theory, curriculum development theory, survey design, um, and also very uh, common tips and tricks on how to give presentations and how to do chalk talks from our best educators in Wash U. Um, and then you are tied together with um, someone who does didactics for the medical school and give lectures to the medical students. 
Um, you also are then pulled into every single possible teaching opportunity that is available within the department. Um, and, and in your third year, you do a capstone research project that is an educational effort. Someone also asked about clinical reasoning in specific. Um, I will just share my experience. So you, if you don't follow Jerome Estrada on Twitter already, you really, really need to, especially for you ID aficionados. Um, he is uh, MD Dream Chaser, um, uh, and then also Wu IDX. Um, he um, and I, he's the clerkship director. When, when COVID happened, we switched to all Zoom and um, we developed a clinical reasoning curriculum for the medical students from scratch where we would uh, give them basic understanding and theory on clinical reasoning with the lecture and follow that up with multiple um, small group discussions, much like VMR, um, where we walk through a case together with medical students and we're, we're blind into the case. Um, with that, we also integrated CP solvers. We had them do pre-work where they listen to an episode from CP solvers, one of the very early ones, like. I think episode five or six or something on abdominal pain and, and fever uh, to give them a little bit of a primer before entering into that. And, and now clinical reasoning, they're creating a new curriculum for the entire med school is integrated into the curriculum from year one all the way to year four. So there's plenty of opportunity now um, for house staff to get involved and, and help with um, the clerkship. So all that to be said and done, I think it, like I said before, if it is something that you're interested in, people do it. There's an avenue for it, and we will move you along in that direction of whatever you so choose. Oh, my God. I, it seems like you literally meant you could talk for an hour about your program director, and you could talk for a whole day about your program. It's really yeah. a delight to see. Um, and uh, I, I, as I mentioned a moment, I must confess, I got to I got to leave in three minutes to join my team for rounds and maybe budget an extra minute to get out of my sports gear. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let the next question be asked. And then I remember that Shreyas and Mohit uh, gave you their email. So please, please, please feel free to reach out to them. Or you can send emails um, to the clinical problem solvers as you have been, and we'll happily forward them to Shreyas and Mohit. Um, so Sarah, do you mind unmuting and asking your question before we say goodbye to our friends here? Of course, sorry that I don't have my video today. It's just because I'm like running rants, but um, thank you for answering all those questions. I'm very, very glad to hear all those answers. Um, I actually wanted to ask, especially like since step one is like becoming pass and fail, how can you stand up in your program and how, what your program actually looks in an applicant? Shreyas, um, yep. you want to talk about how you stand up in the program? I think you've already, um, you know, done an amazing job from intern year and even now. So Yeah, for sure. So I think one thing, like every other program, I think our program also loves to see a, a vision. I think some people who want to really know how they want to plan their careers, I think that's always nice because um, Fortunately, I think the program has a lot of resources, regardless of the career path you choose. I think like Mohit was saying, there's a teaching pathway. If you were looking at yourself, looking at yourself as a clinical educator, there is a leadership pathway. If you're looking at administrative uh, kind of positions in, you know, in the long-term horizon. And you know, the, there's also the research pathway, which is very obvious. So I think understanding and knowing you know where your strength lies and really exploiting that strength is going to be important um i think in the overall in the larger scheme of things but other than that always the usual things you know having uh you know a good profile you know, being good on paper i think these are things that will help regardless of which regardless of program type um will help so um i don't know if that answered your question um yeah, I think I think the thing that makes you stand out in the program itself as a resident is genuine care for patients. Number one, I think that is cannot be overstated. Like that is all. If there's one thing you were going to do, it is that. Um, and then the second thing, like Shreyas brought up before, it's not about the knowledge base that you have coming in. It's not about 
can I rattle off all these facts? It's just a desire to grow. It's a desire to have curiosity and, and let that curiosity flourish in, in this environment. So that those are really the two big things. And then the third is, you know, very dependent on who you are. If you have a passion, pursue it. If you don't have a passion and are still curious on what that passion may be, reach out and try and find it. We can help, you know, instill that passion into you. Um, and and what what makes people really stand out, and I think I this is what I love about this program, is that we're all in it together. Um, that everyone who is on the wards or in the clinic, they're always helpful to hand uh, to, to help each other out. Um, we have teams in clinic where uh, you are you are working with the same house staff through your three years, and you really really grow with that group. Um, because then you're sharing patients in the primary care clinic together. And so you are helping manage. If, my, if Shreyas is on vacation and we're on a team together, I'm seeing his patients. And, and I'm not batting an eye about it because I said that's what we need to do to make sure that you have the time off that you need, um, especially during things like interview season, during things like family um, uh, or personal events that happen in life. It's very important to have a program that says, I'll step up, no, no question asked, do what you need to do, and, and we'll be here for you. And, that, and that's really the big thing um, that makes this program stand out. Um, in terms of being an applicant, uh, I, I think we talked a little bit about that already, but, but genuinely we look at the whole uh, person uh, in, in the application process and, and we want you to share what your vision is for yourself and how we can help you achieve that. A beautiful words to end on. Thank you so much for joining us, Mohit and Treyas. I'll remind everybody that this is above and beyond. They're doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. Not only did they bring a case to us, but Mo Mohit sat in the uh, historically uncomfortable, but increasingly comfortable lukewarm seat. And I don't know um, if anything can do justice to the depth of their responses um, than joining us on a Saturday and taking an hour and a half of their time. Thank you both, truly. And I, uh, there's, um, there's no doubt that um, uh, your your program is amazing because of what you said, but also in its reflection through your eyes and how we both see and um, how we both see you and what you have to share. It clearly reflects um, a beautiful synergy between you as people and your program. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being incredible CP solvers, VMR community members from the very beginning. And uh, we'll hope to see you around in general. And if you ever want to come back and represent the program again in the future, it would be a delight to have you. I, uh, I do want to say that I am, of course, you two are representing a massive, um, incredible program, and I am representing many voices uh, from the CP solvers, and I just want to specifically shout out everyone who's here, Danya, Kiara, Kirtan, Maura, um, Rafa, and Tiago, and I'm missing some people. Sakriti is here too. I saw Gabrielle earlier. I see Franco here, um, all these people, and I hope I'm not missing anyone else um, do incredible work to make this happen. So all these wonderful people getting together. And I hope all of you who are new to this platform enjoyed it. And we hope to see you next Saturday for a very special event where we actually will do a mock interview. So um, Ravi Singh, um, a beloved APD at a program in, um, in Maryland will actually be interviewing Rafa, Sukriti, and then myself. And I will warn you in advance, it's going to get very spicy. Um, well, I will be very spicy, but Rafa and Sakriti will be their usual amazing selves. We'll hope to see you then. Bye.